Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Arwain aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lintamande. Thread 4, Project Lawful and Their Oblivious Boyfriend. Episode 95. Breakout Room 4 is the one with the large circular table where up to 16 people can sit and all readily see one another. It's got a beach-becoming forest view instead of an ocean view because the ocean has waves and waves can be more hypnotizing and distracting than looking at a forest. At some point they will need to give all the rooms silly names. Keltham has never thought to inquire as to the why of this tradition, but it is so universally practiced in civilization that it cannot possibly fail to be important somehow. This being the case, the job is too weighty to be undertaken lightly, and for now he's just numbered them. So, Keltham says to the eight remaining project researchers, plus, apparently, Broom, who's taken a chair off to a corner, but okay, fine. Before proceeding, I'd like everyone, well except Broom, Carissa, and Asmodia, to consider what minimum weekly salary would make you cheerful. Not just, that's enough money, and you're getting your due and fair share, but the least amount that first makes you feel definitely noticeably happy. If you're not sure whether you're feeling cheerful yet, when you imagine getting paid that amount, increase the amount until you're sure. Oh, try not to anchor off Asmodia, because her psychology is hers and not yours. I actually wish in retrospect we hadn't had that visible conversation at all, but oh well. Once you know the amount, write it down on a scrap, fold it up. Don't include your name. Intended use, I'll collect the amounts afterwards and that'll give me a picture of how the situation generally looks. If no possible sum of money could make you cheerful, even if it was a billion gold pieces per minute, but you are grimly and darkly determined to succeed on the project anyways, you can just not put anything on the scrap and leave it blank. It doesn't have to be possible for money to make somebody happy, even in civilization, and definitely not here. Gregoria gives this some consideration before indeed deciding to leave her piece of paper blank. Money can't buy most of the things that she wants and the project might in fact be able to get her them anyway, but not via money. Also, it makes her more deep and mysterious, which is apparently required for a romance with Keltham. Meritzel puts down 50 gold a week because it's enough money for everything you could dream of except magic items. And she isn't sure she'd stop if she started thinking of salaries that let you afford magic items. Ioni is legit not that materialistic. She wants knowledge and to see all of reality. Being paid over twice what she's worth is enough to make her happy she thinks. Ioni also thinks of herself as less insane than Asmodia. 25 GP slash week. Pilar starts to put down zero GP slash week because she is not a heretic, is stopped by a prompt from her curse reminding her that her superiors ordered her not to lie to Keltham and that this may include lying just to avoid being heretical. Keltham may notice and that wouldn't serve Lord Asmodeus, would it? and after some internal fighting, puts down 5 GP slash week. Peranza would have been cheerful with 25 GP slash week a few days earlier, but has been through a couple of fairly traumatic experiences on Project Lawful since then, the previous one being told to train her own impersonator. Now Peranza finds that to actually be cheerful, in her imagination she'd need Asmodia for the circle wizard money. But that would still do it. Peranza's brain has had some time to recover and notice that nobody has killed her for heresy yet. She agonizes a bit about whether to lie about the result, once obtained, but concludes that she's under orders not to tell unauthorized lies and hasn't been authorized or told otherwise by security. 75 GP slash week Peranza may not have a good internal referent for what it would actually feel like to be cheerful. She felt differently about something at 75 GP anyways. Tanya would be cheerful at 5 GP slash week, because that's more money than anyone she met in her entire childhood has had at one time. That's what cheerfulness is, she's pretty sure. Asmodia would be more nervous if she hadn't remembered that Keltham was a cleric of Abadar, and also, like, that she has ever met Keltham. She started writing something down on a piece of paper shortly after Keltham spoke. It's clearly too long to be a price. Keltham waited an appropriately long time after Asmodia started that, so it wouldn't look like he was being prompted into action by Asmodia. 
then looked thoughtful, took a long look at everyone present, and then started writing his own long statement. Predictions, he says. He writes quickly and gets done before everybody else has arrived at their cheerful price, and folds up the result himself. Keltham has the bluff of a five-year-old. She wishes he also had the credulity of a five-year-old. Her life would be so much easier. When everyone is done, Keltham collects the paper scraps, looks through them, and smiles. Right then. Well, I expect that most of your real compensation will be in resellable shares of the future income of the project, which will vest in you over time as you work here. That's how it's done in civilization. But it's highly uncertain how much those end up being worth, and also people need to buy things now and then. So it's also considered good practice in civilization to pay researchers some reasonable core salaries and regular money meant to be less volatile. The basic schema I'm working with here is that we have Tier 1 and Tier 2 researcher employees, with myself the sole member of Tier 0, following some standard schemes in civilization for compensating people working on projects like these. The Tier 1 S are, currently this is potentially something that changes over time, Carissa, Asmodia, Meritzel, and Ioni, all of whom have displayed rapid learning speed on law. Ioni also warns this site about incoming military attacks, which is worth some significant bonus pay. And Carissa is currently operating as my de facto second-in-command, an ops person, and general Keltham maintainer. Tonia, Peranza, Gregoria, and Pilar are Tier 2. Except that Pilar is providing snacks catering, and may possibly turn out to be incredibly important somehow, in the same fashion as Ioni. The expectation of Pilar maybe being important later is worth its own bonus. Basic salaries for a project lawful researcher. Now, I realize that this isn't as much as a security wizard makes, even though you're more valuable to Cheliax than they are. But again, most of your real compensation will be in resellable shares of future project income vesting over time. Are 100 gold per week at Tier 2, 200 gold per week at Tier 1, and 500 gold per week at Tier 0. Iona, you save Cheliax way more than two raised deads at the cost of some potential and maybe actual damage to yourself, but Myalil says he can't politically swing a 10,000 gold bonus, so for now I'm putting you down as having a secondary role as special forecaster, which pays an additional 200 gold per week. Pilar, you get an additional 50 gold per week for Caden, Kylie, and services that just might be much more important than they look with an expectation of further payment if they are, plus a 1,000 gold bonus for taking a sword that might possibly have led into some further and disastrous plot by Nadal if it had been allowed to kill me. Carissa is tier 0 0.9, you might say, and receives 300 gold per week, and should be considered to have authority here as my second. Oh, and Asmodia obviously receives 75 gold per week, since she did say out loud that was enough to make her cheerful. Any questions? There was something of hell in that. Not very much, but more than she's seen from Keltham before. She tries to look a totally reasonable amount of delighted and not a ridiculous amount of delighted. Except probably he's joking and that's what the Asmodia and Keltham writing each other notes is about. Tanya starts nervously giggling. She can't help herself. She can help herself, but it'd be difficult. Meritzel is pretty sure this is the best thing that has ever happened. Maybe that's what's meant by an amount of money you're cheerful about. It should feel like the best thing that ever happened. Except it wouldn't without Asmodia also getting put in her place. If Keltham is serious about that. A Chelish person would be deadly serious, but it's Keltham. And she's pretty sure he's... What's the word? Trolling. Is that actually the first time in her life that Ioni has ever been appreciated for anything? Possibly. She's not sure. She's Oracle of Nethys, and it shouldn't be possible to buy her loyalty with, like, money, instead of knowledge or what serves Nethys, or at least incredibly rare and irreplaceable books. But what with Cheliax having not even bothered to bid, they're not exactly making it difficult for Keltham to straight up buy her loyalty with money. She doesn't even know what she's going to do with that money. It's just working on her anyways. She can feel her loyalties shifting as she thinks, even though the money in this case is coming directly from Cheliax. 
Some Asmodeans really need to rethink some of their strategies here. Pilar is in a state of existential panic. Not that this shows on her face. She's a slave of Asmodeus. Slave. What do slaves of Asmodeus do with this amount of money? Can she, is she supposed to, donate it to the Church of Asmodeus? Pilar. This is how lawful good paladins think, Pilar. Do you actually know how Asmodean theology works literally at all, Pilar? Ah! Gregoria thinks this is very generous and in line with the enormous benefits the queen promised a night ago. She is grateful to her imperial magistrix. Asmodea silently unfolds and then holds up a sheet of paper saying, Prediction. Keltham tries to torment me by claiming he'll only pay me 75 GP slash week, which is less than he's planning to pay anyone else here. Probability, 95%. It's practically like being back in civilization. Keltham partially unfolds and holds up his own scrap of paper, still half-folded. Coal 1. Ordinary Asmodia Coal 2. Conspiracy. Asmodia Coal 3. Time-traveling Asmodia. One loop only. Probability that. Her sheet of paper predicts I troll her. 0 0.90 vertical bar. 0 0.70 vertical bar. 0 0.90. If so, that her sheet of paper estimates a probability. 0 0.40 vertical bar. 0.6. Zero vertical bar, point nine zero. Carissa attempts some quick math in her head to figure out whether Keltham Net updated in favor of conspiracy off this, and therefore whether she needs to punish Asmodia. She is quickly coming to despise both of them, which is probably not the most helpful attitude to have about this. Put a pin in that and come back to it later. Asmodia's sheet of paper predicting the outcome is a 9-7 update for regular over conspiracy, the inclusion of a number is 6-4 in favor of conspiracy. So on net an update for conspiracy, ha, she'll get to punish Asmodea for it. Though it'd be better if she'd thought to predict in advance that Asmodea's paper-writing spree of excessive cleverness, whatever the details, would net persuade Keltham towards conspiracy. Planning to turn around the sheet of paper and show us anything else? Asmodea slowly turns around her sheet of paper to reveal that the other side is blank. I'm going to hold off on conceding anything until you show us the probability you assigned that I'd have a second side to my sheet of paper, says Asmodia. Of course. Keltham unfolds his own sheet of paper, and that she predicts my prediction of her. 0 0.60 vertical bar, 0 0.10 vertical bar, 0 0.80. Conspiracy Asmodia would love to have me believe that I'm thinking one level ahead of her while she's actually thinking one level ahead of me, Keltham says. She was fucking thinking that. Ah, uh, she needs to learn this faster. Nothing shows on her face. She cannot pause in horror. She must be alter Asmodia now, and she has the headband to enforce that on herself. Or I, you know, have literally been doing this less than a day. Now what's on the other side of your paper? Some way of tormenting me yet more. 75%. Nothing. 25%. And this is why you don't try to get into cleverness contests with Keltham, you fucking idiot. Actually, security, communicate to Asmodia straight-up orders that the next time she comes up with something incredibly clever to do, she does not do it literally regardless of the details of what it is, and communicate the same thing to Ione. Keltham flips his paper all the way over. Actual probabilities. Predict, 0 0.80, vertical bar, 0 0.40. Vertical bar, 0 0.90. Probability, 0 0.50. Vertical bar, 0 0.60. Vertical bar, 0 0.90. Predicts second, 0 0.40. Vertical bar, 0 0.20. Vertical bar, 0 0.80. Conspiracy, Asmodia. Mostly wouldn't try playing this game against me in the first place. It's too potentially revealing. Unless she's already sure of how I'd update off her not playing, of course, but she probably hasn't seen enough of me to be sure what level I'd think on here. Welcome to civilization, Asmodia. You'll do just fine. The order stands, even though Carissa's going to have to recalculate the actual change in Keltham's predictions to figure out whether she can punish Asmodia or not. Also, she notes that the path to evil for Keltham plainly lies in his conviction that lying to and manipulating people is completely fine, and in fact hilarious, as long as you are trolling them. Some people should start thinking about lies and manipulations that are satisfactorily, 
evil, even with the apparent constraint that you later declare them to have been trolling. I am confused about what we are supposed to believe at this point, says Gregoria. Unless being confused about what we're supposed to believe is part of this lesson. Asmodia can explain it during her lecture. Alter Asmodia has not been scared at any point during this conversation and speaks accordingly. I'm confident in my new ability to explain the law of probability in words. What the two of us just did, not so much. Flirting, Asmodia. It's called flirting. Yeah, I wouldn't have done that to a boy. The first two layers, maybe, not the third one. Gregoria is in fact pretty sure that Asmodia cannot explain one. Whether the announcement of their pay was real or was part of an elaborate, manipulative, flirtatious game with Asmodia too. Whether the announcement of Asmodia's pay was real or part of an elaborate, manipulative, flirtatious game with Asmodia 3. What share of the lessons in general are manipulative, flirtatious games? Which, honestly, manipulative, flirtatious games seem way more Asmodean than everything they were doing last week. But she'd gotten used to doing a different thing, and now she needs to switch back? She conceals her distress about this, obviously. Carissa is at this point incredibly confused about what Dathalanus believe about mixing sex and work, but in a positive direction, she thinks? The more incredibly unprofessional Keltham is being, the more they can get past him? Probably. Merrickcell at no point thought they were not playing manipulative, flirtatious games at least ten times as much as they are building civilization. But she's incredibly upset that she didn't get a plus six headband to master probability and comprehend everything. She could have done it. And she's far more loyal than Asmodia. So, were those your actual probabilities? Yep. I'm not sure what reward you're supposed to get if I'm not fucking you about this, given that we were apparently flirting. Uh, we'll work out something. Security, please copy to Savar that if Keltham is telling the truth about his probabilities there, there would have been a threefold shift upward in his conspiracy ratio if I hadn't played this game. Though that doesn't make sense to me. Maybe his numbers were conditional on his having observed me starting to write. But still... We don't get to back off and play safe because we're scared. He's predicting that, too. The problem isn't doing any things, ever. It's unilaterally doing excessively clever things because you're pleased with yourself for having thought them up. A tendency which, in the last two days, took a literal divine intervention to get you to stop in one case, and caused this morning which was a net loss, if an unavoidable one, because you no longer had the acting ability to be normal as Modia, and now caused this event, which is an unsustainable pace of excessive cleverness. But noted. If Keltham's not lying about his latest set of probabilities, which is what he'd obviously be doing if he in fact updated strongly towards conspiracy off the events of this morning. Gregoria takes a deep breath and decides that, well, she's on the low punishment regimen, and they said it looks bad when only Ione argues. Keltham, do you want to call the rest of us back when you're done flirting and want to present salary offers? Yes, sorry about that. The basic salary offers are as described. All amounts in gold per week, 100 Gregoria, 100 Tonya, 100 Peranza, Pilar, 100 base plus 50 divine candy services, plus one-time bonus 1,000, Maritzel 200, Asmodia 200, Ione 200, base plus 200 divine forecasting services, Carissa 300. Everyone fine with that part pending what's going to be a more complicated discussion of sellable shares of future income that vest over time and how those work. He is greeted with suspicious silence. In Dathilan, is there some phrase that communicates, okay, actually, I'm being serious now? One would say outside quotes, quote, meta, I'm being serious now, to quote. Sorry. Meta, I'm being serious now. Please indicate clearly if you're okay with the non-volatile core salary that you've just been offered, pending acceptable shares of income, which, to be clear, I am pretty much assuming that I'm going to offer and you're all going to stare blankly at, and then trust that I was being fair and take it. But I can truth spell myself about that, and use the fair division spell too, if you'd like. In fact, I'm going to do that anyways, before we sign a final contract. It's just good practice. Anyways, hands up. If you were okay with the core salary part of your offer, pending satisfactory shares. Up go hands. Even Asmodia's hand goes up. I'll register that if I end up proving my ability to teach in your place, and subsequently end up contributing more than base tier 1 S, I'll expect a relative pay increase. But as I haven't proven any such thing yet, 
this is fine to start. Alter Asmodia definitely has a rivalry going with Alter Merit Cell, too. And Alter Merit Cell needs to be put on notice of impendingly becoming the least valuable Tier 1 with nothing special about her. Remember the lesson of the jelly chip production game that disintegrated because each child, even out of Doth Elan, decided that the kind of token they held must be the most important and valuable kind of token. With that, said, sure, if I decide you're contributing substantially more than other Tier 1s, you'll get appropriately higher compensation. But not to make that sound too easy. A good threshold for that is whether the difference is so substantial that even the other tier ones notice and are like, yep, Asmodia sure is doing more for the project than we are. Yep. I assume, perhaps falsely, that this difference is apparent to all with respect to what Carissa contributes and what Ione saved the project when Nadal attacked. Make it that obvious and sure. Carissa's fourth circle, says Gregoria cautiously. Because it hasn't gone wrong yet, and if you leave all the pushback to heretics, then it'll all be heresy-flavored. We're mostly not actually doing magic, though? She's a fourth circle who can use spell silver from seven feet away. But if that was all we needed, we could go grab a seventh circle wizard whenever. It's more that while the rest of you are doing whatever it is you do when I'm not looking, Carissa is spending a bunch of her time maintaining the critical Keltham component of the project, and that whenever I have a task like... So how do I actually get 200 mice plus their living supplies if I need those? Carissa is the one who I talk to in order to translate that idea to more Galarian standard terms. She's the one who worked with me on figuring out requirements for the fortress you're now living in, etc. etc. To translate to what I conjecture to be your own more Galarian standard terms, compensation is based on the negotiating power you have, and the negotiating power you have is based on your irreplaceability. Carissa is the person other than myself whom it'd be most crippling for the project to lose and most impossible to replace. Gregoria nods, satisfied. That's kind of just you're sleeping with her, but not entirely. Again, to be clear, if you're wondering why that doesn't come out of my own share, to whatever extent Carissa is maintaining me and I'm putting inputs into the project, the answer is that in ideal terms, that should give you the same end result. I may not have keeper levels of coherence about that, but that just means there's residual error. It doesn't mean I'm terrible when I try. If Carissa and myself aggregated into one entity, I'd award that entity 800 gold per month, plus the combined profit share I haven't got to. Then I'd pay Carissa with 300 gold per month and part of my profit share. My profit share is going to be much larger than Carissa's, not in the same proportions as 500 to 300. Salary is what we use to make sure we have nice things now, and 800 gold is what would make sure that Carissa and myself could both have nice things now, where Carissa does not get anything like three-fifths of my ownership of the project. That makes sense. Keltham will now explain, in all grim determination, the basic concepts that they are also going to own part of the project themselves, in the form of shares, fractions of the project that they own. The project will generate profits, which the project reinvests in more sub-projects that generate more profits, mostly, but eventually the project will start using profits to buy back its own shares, once it runs out of better things to invest in. As a simplified example, there's supposedly a billion people in Galarian. Imagine that the project figured out how to build a widget that costs 1 GP to make, but could sell for 2 GP, and was worth 3 GP to the buyer, and the project managed to sell one widget like that to everyone in Galarian, but then had nothing else to do with itself, so it bought back all its shares and closed down. The total profits would then be a billion gold pieces, owning one ten-thousandth of that project. Now is then like owning something that will be worth 100, 000, 000 GP later, but only if that project actually succeeds. People don't get this share right away any more than you get paid up front for the next ten years of salary. It vests over time, though usually not on quite the same schedule that a salary gets paid out. You can, according to the contract to be signed, sell your profit share to somebody else, but you probably shouldn't, and definitely not without consulting Keltham. You know, actually given the Manohar thing, 
Keltham's just going to write into the contract that he must legally be allowed to have a consultation session with any of the researchers before they sell any of their shares. Cheliax is investing a bunch of money in this project and receives convertible debt that can either get paid back at face value plus high interest before the project buys back anything else, or convert into regular project income shares at a discount that grows with, but not as fast as the project grows. One billion gold pieces, or one gold piece per person, which an unskilled labor is. Ten days of unskilled labor outside Cheliax, or five days within it, thanks. Yeah, he'll stick with that wild guess round number. That sounds like roughly the right ballpark figure for where the project could end up. In general, Keltham is looking to increase the wealth of Galarian by much more than just two gold pieces per person. He is definitely looking to save more than twenty days of labor for everyone. But to get to that point, some of the work will be done by spin-off corporations that need to pay income shares to their own investors and researchers. Though the project might still take a share in those spin-offs if the project is providing key ideas or training their people. You can't actually realistically capture half the gains to a whole planet of a technological revolution like this one, even in just the more material aspects. Keltham is going to try to grab a relatively larger share of gains at first because he expects to have so many other projects that he needs to reinvest in. But in the longer run where the really large profits start to come in, no, it won't be half the gains. There comes a point past which it's sort of silly to try. So although it is a very wild figure, Keltham is guessing that the 10-year or 15-year profits of the project should end up at somewhere near a billion gold. Could be a hundred million gold. Could be zero. For it to be ten billion gold probably requires looking far enough in the future that people are wealthy enough to have that much to pay. The project doesn't need to have started buying back its shares for you to get paid. The idea would usually be that somebody else buys those shares from you in the expectation that the project will buy them back later, at an increased price that looks a lot like whatever interest rates are like around here. The share you get is usually one where, for you to sell right now, to somebody who didn't really believe in the project, would not be worth too much compared to your regular salary. If you want to get incredibly rich this way, you need the project to succeed and convince its skeptics so they want to buy your shares at some reasonable fraction of what they'll be worth after 15 years since projects start. Eight days ago, Carissa would have said that being wealthy beyond her wildest dreams and safe was all she wanted in life. However. Carissa eight days ago was small and unambitious, and at this point her to-do list is so daunting that she's not totally sure a million gold makes much of a dent in it. She needs to figure out how Chelish people can be Dathilani without exploding, and that might require some fundamental revisions to Asmodianism as taught to humans, because Asmodianism as taught to lawful beings is necessarily very different, and no one is willing to just sit her down and tell her what it is. It is possible it will also require revisions to hell, which she's aware that objectively her odds of success at that can't look very high, but it's not like who rules the various layers of hell never changes, or like the archdevils don't have a great deal of power within their own domains. It occurred to her yesterday, uncomfortably so, that an easier way to get what she wants might in fact be to donate her vast sums of money and go to Axis with Keltham. It's not tempting. Ironically, it's not tempting because of good impulses she's indulging as much as because of evil ones. Going to Axis might be an all-right way for Carissa to go about her work, having lost a part of herself, but not all the parts of herself. But most people who try to do things in the world and don't end up with a billion gold about it will go to hell, and so hell needs to be able to use them. She doesn't actually want to escape eternal torment. She wants the eternal torment to be shaped right, and if that requires impressing Asmodeus enough to have the resources to displace an archdevil then... Well, she isn't sure it's an insane ambition. She isn't sure it isn't, but she isn't sure it is. But a million gold pieces is barely even the first step. Everything will be so much easier if she corrupts Keltham, and then he can work on this with her. Sounds like something that is both reasonable to want and possible to achieve. 
hints about how Carissa Savar can solve her own problems for herself will be available if she prays for them. To Irori outside the interdiction zone, though Irori realises this is not a very likely confluence of events. Has Keltham been getting any signs of understanding here, or a lot of fixedly permanently cheerful expressions? They seem to mostly be following along. The big problem is just that you're not supposed to sign contracts you mostly understand. But on the other hand, it's Keltham. Well, he's not going to have them sign anything now, of course. He's checking to make sure they even want the contents of the contract before he spends a lot of time drawing that up. Equity allocations. 74% Keltham, 1.3% Carissa, 0.25% Ioni, 0.2%, Asmodia Meritzel, 0.15% Pilar, 0.1% Gregoria slash Peranza slash Tonia. The remainder is for the project to give its many future researchers and employees their own stakes, though they get smaller as people join later at higher base salaries, and with reduced uncertainty of those shares' future values, or for Cheliacs or other investors to convert its loan shares into later. Plans like this are generally drawn up with an intention that goes something like, if the project is taking slower or needing larger investments and needs to sell more shares than expected, it first starts to come out of Keltham's reserve, especially if the delay looks like it's because Keltham is being less valuable or having less output than he was supposed to. But if the project gets into bad enough shape, it may have to issue and sell additional shares that dilute everyone. This is part of the risk. Conversely, if the project gets visibly on track to be hugely successful and starts earning early profits fast, which might be as simple as figuring out an early and general anti-plague sanitation measure that reduces the incidence of all plagues in all Chelish cities by 10%. In a way that doesn't just restore to the equilibrium, they can expect that fewer total shares than Keltham currently anticipates will be issued, and their own shares will be accordingly more valuable. Blah blah vesting schedules, these initial allocations will at their slowest vest over four years. Hitting milestones can result in faster vesting. Keltham will draw up relatively informal milestones for them that he judges, and set more formal ones for himself and truth spell himself about them. Even after shares vest, you shouldn't expect to be able to sell them to an outside buyer for what they're probably worth. People outside the project know that people inside the project have private information about how well the project is likely to do over the future and they'll discount apparent prices accordingly if the person inside the project seems to want to sell. This difficulty in reselling causes researchers to expect to hold their shares for longer, which in turn helps to align incentives as the researchers think about how to make the project actually be valuable in 15 years, and not just look valuable at the time their shares vest. This is probably a much bigger factor here than it would be in civilization. In civilization, any large project, let alone this one, would have Nimamel looking at it, if she were alive, or people only slightly worse than her if not, and people wouldn't expect apparent values to get away from actual prices by much. It is proverbial in civilization that no amount of clever planning can eliminate a very, very large residual probability that all your project's shares end up being worth exactly zero which scary thought should be handled by meditating on your cheerful plus base salaries that you arrived at without considering your equity. It's also considered stupid. In civilization, if the rest of your reasoning doesn't end up at a point where your valuable researchers can spend money right now in a way that gives them slack, doesn't cause them to be distracted by silly things, buy productivity-related magic items, and have somebody else organize their house for them, etc., Though obviously, all negotiations are conducted on the basis of, I have this valuable labor, and I'm not giving it to you unless I'm paid, and then once I have my money, it's my own business what I do with it. Not, give me more money in the expectation that I'll spend it on myself, in a way that makes me more productive. If the project starts needing to do the latter, it will probably indicate something wrong, but the repair algorithm would involve the project paying for productivity things directly. Though, in this case, there's stuff like intelligence headbands, where Cheliax rents those to the project, gets convertible debt accordingly, the project loans headbands to people while they work, and they can use their salaries to buy those headbands if they wish, so they'll still have them afterwards and then loan them to the project themselves. Anyways, 
Don't get emotionally wrapped up in the sense that you'll be worth a million gold pieces in 15 years based on your unvested equity allocations. That's not a thing that has happened to you. It's a collective plan to achieve something not yet achieved. The contract sounds pretty good in principle, and they'll probably want it, though. They'll have to read it first. It's advised to go over a really serious contract with a devil before you sign it if it's about enough money to warrant the cost of summoning one. Okay, Meritzel thinks. But it'd be nice to also separately have some way to see if the contract cheats them horribly. Tonya is pretty sure everyone is just emitting meaningless noises at this point, and she should go on having more money than she ever dreamed of and just worry about the project not falling apart completely. Of course. I'm not asking you to rely on just my truth spell and my fair division spell. I'd expect Cheliax and Luralatha to want to look at this anyways. You're still their people, and they consider this project an important matter. Are people okay with these specific equity divisions, not just the general setup? Yes, but I have no idea how you derived them, and I'm kind of curious, Gregoria says. It's derived based on the assumption that the fair and good consequence practices for a world-reshaping company in Galarian, started by one interplanar traveler, will be exactly the same as what they were for a couple of famous ultra-profitable companies in Dath Ilan, started by individual super-geniuses because I have absolutely no hope of rederiving anything more sensible than that from scratch. If, hypothetically, it turns out that I'm actually better at teaching people probability than you are, once I've learned it from you. The point at which you start getting larger allocations is when you're doing things nobody else could do, not just things nobody else is doing right now. If you start learning from me or reteaching in a way that we just can't find any other researchers to compete with, that's the point at which you have the leverage to come to the project and say 2% or I'm going home. I would ask if Sivar is that much harder to replace than me, because, in fact, there aren't that many other people running around to whom Nethys's heralds are known to deliver prophecies. But I'm guessing from the numbers that Sivar's 1.3% is 0.3%, her irreplaceability to the project, and 1% her irreplaceability to Keltham which therefore comes out of Keltham's allocation of 75%. Indeed. What would all these numbers look like if we do figure out how to retrieve the Dathalani true dead to here or something? If that was pulled off largely because of me, they'd immediately replace all the actual work I was doing, but I'd still fairly receive half the resulting gains they captured based on the algorithm I showed you. Their decision to join doesn't accomplish anything until you add Keltham to actually retrieve them here though I'd just reinvest nearly all of that in whatever investment fund they built. If Cheliax or Asmodeus pulls that off largely without me, the incoming Dathalani form a new company and give me a small share corresponding to the role I played in letting Cheliax know that this was possible and valuable. Nod. Makes sense, I think. She wants to be more valuable than Keltham, but it sounds like he'd still get a lot of the value capture since he's the reason she noticed she could. This is skipping over some things I thought I would have a chance to say to you in private later, because I didn't realize this was coming up in quite this way. But my interest here is maybe 10% getting rich and 90% getting to go where Keltham goes and see what Keltham sees and learn what Keltham learns to Carl. I suspect that's what Nethys wants, too. Can we cut my share in half in exchange for an agreement like that? That sounds a bit more personal. Not opposed to it, but not exactly the sort of thing that the project settles with you. And I'm not sure I'm ready to buy half your shares from you at that price. All right. It's just that, in reality, the money has very little to do with why I'm staying on. And I will be a little disappointed if I don't get what I was really hoping for more than a little bit. Well, good for expressing that, because it is not something I am currently promising you or offering to trade to you. The money is meant to be good enough that, even if I wasn't going to take you with me when I left Galarian, if that happens, you would still want to work here, because in fact you're still getting paid thirty times what you could make anywhere else. And then, some day, you'd spend that money on traveling this world, or traveling other planes. I'm not saying you can't have that thing you just asked for. I'm saying that I'm not offering to trade it to you for your project work. This large amount of money now, and maybe way more future money later, is what the project is offering to trade to you. 
Civilization does consider it a best practice to draw a sharp line whereby the founders don't offer to trade away themselves, their things, their lives, when they're starting a company like this one. The project isn't owed that from me. Understood. Does this mean you have worked out a contract with Cheliax where they'll be paying you enough gold for all these salaries? Asks Meritzel. My y'all thinks he can swing it in terms of project budget, but that's just Cheliax paying you. Not yet Cheliax trading money to the project for convertible debt and the project paying you. I'm not going to make you wait on your salaries while I sort out that part. Next step, according to civilization best practices, is that I walk out of the room and let you discuss this among yourselves for a while. I'd say, however long is needed, but in Da Thilan, it'd be obvious that the time for this step is more like thirty minutes than half a day. You can have somebody call me back in, if there's additional questions. When and if everyone thinks they're okay. If there aren't new terms requiring amendment, you tell me that, and then I go talk to Mail about initializing the salary part of this. Roughly the idea is that, before you form a more load-bearing verbal assent to this plan, which I then go write up as a contract, you're supposed to talk about it among yourselves, without me there in the room, in case there's some part of your brain that can't fully correct for the effect of my being there, on your willingness to accept a deal I proposed. Any of you individually can and should go off and consider it quietly on your own for a few minutes, if you notice your brain being at all influenced by the others present. Carissa, you also need to leave at some point for at least five minutes of them talking, without you, because you're above them in the organizational structure. You clear for me to head out now? Yes, they chorus. What are they supposed to think once he's not there? I am confused by the math Keltham's using, but I think this is a good deal if we succeed. Carissa says blandly, as she would in Alter Cheliax. Oh, are they assuming Keltham might still be listening? I want to read my notes again, says Gregoria. One minute, please. Security notifies everyone that Keltham is comfortably out of hearing range. He grabbed a security and went for a walk on the fortress ramparts. My curse says it wants to report somebody to her superior for non-Asmodean thought and claims that I'm obligated by standard regulations to pass that report along without delay. It reports Pilar Pineda for having considered donating almost all of her bonus and salary to the Church of Asmodeus without expecting to derive any personal benefit from that, which is, it asserts, heresy to Lord Asmodeus and also to Caden Kalian and is what annoying lawful good paladins do. And suggests that she be corrected by a process which includes drunken revelry. Pilar is not saying that. Oh, I actually think I can't help you with that, Pilar. What with only the Grand High Priestess being authorized to correct you in matters of theology, though I do think I know what mistake you're making. It seems related to the secret story Mayel told her about the man who was pleasing because his only interest in slavery was in being a slave. Carissa thinks it is not her thing herself, actually. I'll report myself to the Most High, then. Pilar was hoping to hear, Well, your curse is obviously lying to you, and not, I think I know what mistake you're making. But she obviously isn't going to argue with the answer she got. I am not coming up with very much for Alter Asmodia to say here. She is mostly sort of e-complications and wow money and scheming to get a 2% share instead of a 0.2% share, but none of that is something she has to discuss with the rest of you. Alter Ioni has established herself as not really caring. Meritzel, do you know what we could be talking about while he's gone? Real Asmodea doesn't like Meritzel, but is a professional about her actual job. Meritzel doesn't like Asmodea either, but that sounds like a problem to solve once they're rich and powerful by which time it might solve itself via Asmodia defecting, which will settle once and for all which of them is smarter. Unless Cheliax requests pushback in some form because there's some angle on corrupting Keltham, I don't care about this and want to get to learning things, and I think Alter Merrickcell would feel the same way. All right. I doubt Keltham will actually ask us what we discussed. I think that probably violates the civilizational procedure he's proposing. But if he does, we tried for another few minutes after this to find something to talk about because Keltham seemed to think we should do it, and then gave up. I did want to say, hopefully quickly, but it seems like the sort of thing that could blow up on us again before we reach the end of the day and have time to talk at leisure. Savar, 
I think I know what I did wrong, and you're not going to like my fault analysis. Go ahead. When I was initially writing down my prediction, I didn't process that as being especially clever. Alter Asmodia knew exactly what Keltham was up to. She's already called out predictions in class. It's very clear that's what Alter Asmodia would do. And Keltham predicted that, I think, inside his ordinary world. Keltham would need to be thinking in a completely different way than his latest thought transcripts show, for him to lie about his final probabilities, there. I think that it must have incorporated the information from him seeing me start to write, because if it doesn't include that information, it's not a real prediction. So, maybe I could have done better if I hadn't written anything at all. But that really wouldn't be what Alter Asmodia would do, why wouldn't she? My huge mistake was when I saw Keltham starting to write. Alter Asmodia knew what he was up to. Alter Asmodia wrote her own prediction of it. Alter Asmodia passed Keltham's test perfectly according to the probabilities he wrote down and won a ton of ordinary points. Real Asmodia thought that she didn't want to look too clever and stopped herself from doing what Alter Asmodia would have done. And I didn't realize, I didn't notice, that I'd suddenly started thinking in a different way, that I was making that choice a different way from the choice that came before. My analysis is that we have to figure out who we are in Alter Chelyaks and just fucking be those people, period. Everything which isn't that is the clever part where we think we're smarter than Keltham. You're right. I don't like it. But I like it better than what happened this morning. The problem we had this morning is that we tried to solve the problem of Keltham asking for a fox's cunning at the same time as we tried to solve the problem of figuring out what happened to Alter Asmodia in Alter Cheliax. It should have just been the simplest thing that explained what Keltham would see. If Ioni had solved her riddle earlier, I suspect Pilar's curse of having selected that riddle to be exactly solvable enough that I wouldn't. Any comments on that, snack service? Did you just fucking call me? I was talking to the curse, not to Pilar, like you asked. Curse says it's not in the habit of answering such terribly personal questions, but it does observe that if you'd trusted more that the riddle was solvable and would be at a difficulty level where it'd be solved in time, you wouldn't have tried a complicated way of scaring Keltham off Fox's cunning like it warned you about once already. And did the curse select a riddle at the exact level of difficulty required for us to learn that valuable lesson about trust? Snack service says no comment. I say that when this is over, it dies. Somehow. It's on my to-do list. I'm going to leave because Keltham said you should talk without me. Someone can come get me in a few minutes and say you're done, if you think that's what happens in Alter Cheliax. In Alter Cheliax, do we all hate each other? Asks Gregoria. Or is that, you know, an Asmodeanism thing? I'm not actually sure. I think most places people do more gestures of liking each other, and those cancel out some of the gestures of hating each other, or make them sting more, depending. If that can genuinely go either way, you can pick what's best for reassuring Keltham or corrupting him. No, wait. If we make a lot of choices like that on the same principle, ugh. I need a cunning and a splendor to figure that out. I wouldn't have made that mistake if I'd had either of those up. I register my suggestion that tomorrow we spend a lot of that day figuring out exactly who we are in Alter Cheliax, and we do that with cunning and wisdom and splendor up. And if that requires Cheliax to teleport in another ten third circle wizards to act as our personal enhancement service, they should just do that for the next month or risk losing Keltham for want of it. I take your point, but I think a lot of my instincts for Keltum decay when I'm not actually talking to him, and I could have avoided some of the problems this morning if I'd been spending more time around him, and I don't really want to freeze him again as soon as tomorrow. Maybe if we have a good talk tonight, I'll put in the request for enhancement regardless. And the glibness! I'm just going to do it as swords if no one can get it to me soon. I had been planning to try for a date with Keltum tonight. Ione, I understand better what you were trying to do when you asked Keltham that question about whether the birds thing was conspiracy revealing. I think a bit better of it now than I did right then. But I do not trust that you've got an alter Ione, thing Taldane doesn't have a word for, that shows no traces or hints of the real Cheliax. And until we've had time to go over that with you on cunning, wisdom, and splendor simultaneously, 
I think you wait to seduce Keltham a little later. I propose, and this is me being clever because I again don't think we have a choice, that we're all in shock about our salary increases and a little more hesitant about our new boss than before, at least for today. And Carissa is the one who's just taking it all in stride and being around Keltham all the same. If that gives away a quarter of a two on conspiracy, we just have to take that hit, because we can lose so much faster if anything complicated happens before we're readier than this. Meritzel never tries anything clever, so she could be not intimidated if Sevar doesn't want to spend the night with Keltham. I'm smarter than you, says Meritzel which is why I'm not doing things that look clever but aren't what I would do in Alter. Carissa uses a minor illusion to make a thunderclap above their heads. Testing whether that's as effective as lighting you on fire, she says. Merit Cell is indeed a good person to put in front of Keltham while we're all confused because Alter Merit Cell seems credibly pretty similar to real Merit Cell. However, I want Keltham tonight— because my model of him suffers when I go this long interacting with people's Keltham guesses and not the real Keltham. And furthermore, I would actually like him to next pick up someone who can give him credible evidence on the masochism front, since that's very entangled, for him, with conspiracy. Nobody wants to demonstrate to her that they need to be set on fire to be quieted. Great! If that's settled, then she'll slip out to Keltham. After she's gone. It actually was a compliment, Meritzel. You say clever things in class. You don't try stupid Nathesian plots. Just don't ask me to phrase it in a way that doesn't sound like an insult, because I can only lower myself so far given our relative pay levels. You take the money, I'll take the lack of brain damage to Corral. If you wish to support this AI reading and others like it, please visit patreon.com slash AI. Any help is appreciated. And thank you to executive producer John Doe 7776059.